All right. Hello, class. I uh, hope you're having a wonderful afternoon. Uh, hope you're ready for some English 1101. If not, it's okay. Uh, we'll get there, I'm sure. Today, we are going to talk about rhetorical strategy. We're also going to talk a little bit about plagiarism. And we're going to finish up with a brief overview of MLA format. Uh, so lots of riveting stuff for you today. I uh, hope you brought your popcorn. Uh, we'll start off with the rhetorical strategies. Slideshow. You all love slideshows. Here we go. Rhetorical strategies. Uh, so you know this is a composition class. It's a writing class. Which means that you'll be expected to write essays. Uh, and to write these essays, you'll need to master rhetorical strategy. So the first question is, what the heck is rhetoric? Uh, rhetoric is defined as the art of effective or persuasive speaking or writing, especially the use of figures of speech and other compositional techniques. Essentially, it is the means by which we use language to persuade other people into accepting our point of view. You might also think of it as your communication strategy. Okay? What are rhetorical strategies? Rhetorical strategies are writing techniques that we may use to achieve the goal of rhetoric, which is persuasion or communication. There are a wide array of rhetorical strategies, ranging from description to exemplification to full-blown argumentation. A mastery of rhetorical strategies endows an individual with a lot of power. Knowledge is power. If you can persuade people and are an effective communicator, the world becomes your oyster. You guys have heard that expression before, right? Just uh, making sure. So there are nine major rhetorical strategies that we have. That's narration, description, exemplification, classification, process writing, definition, compare and contrast, cause and effect. I should say cause and effect. Great. Uh, we always find a typo, right? And then persuasion or argumentation. Sometimes those are split into two. They're very closely related. All righty. So let's go over them. Narration. Narration is the art of storytelling. It's one of the oldest forms of rhetoric. We've been telling uh, stories around the campfire for about as long as there have been campfires. Uh, so when you think of narration, there are factual and fictional narratives. There are stories that are true and stories that are made up, right? So you can, you can kind of pick whether or not you want to do a true story or not. Usually, narratives are in chronological order, right? In other words, the events that are told in the story occur in the order in which they occurred in real life. That is not always the case. Sometimes you have a disruption in the narrative where things that happened uh, in the past will be shown and then things that happened um, you know, in the present and then back to the past and the future. And then, so there are some uh, narratives that sort of break up the, chron the chronology of it all. Right? Um, but when we use narration in the real world, what we're trying to do is tell a story usually that encompasses a series of significant events that happen to us. Uh, and I know you guys have all, you've all got that one friend that likes to tell stories, but they tell them in such a long-winded way uh, that you're just like banging your head against the table wanting, wanting it to end uh, because of all the details. They got to tell you every little thing. So there's an art to storytelling. You want to be concise. You want to be clear. You want to be chronological. So we'll go in more into narration uh, later on. This is one of the strategies, uh, the quiz of which is due this weekend. So you'll want to check that out. Next slide. Description writing. We have a picture of my rooster here, one of them. Uh, description writing focuses on sensory detail. How does it look, smell, taste, feel, etc., to describe a given person, place, object, or setting? We use description writing to paint a mental picture for our readers. This can prove useful in day-to-day -day life. Description writing hinges on the use of specific details. The more specific you are with your descriptive terminology, the more accurate the portrait will be. So if you had to describe my rooster here, you could probably come up with a lot of uh, colorful adjectives to do so. Moving on to the next. This is just an overview. We're going to discuss all of these at greater length later. Exemplification. Exemplification writing involves the use or inclusion of specific examples to reinforce a given main idea, argument, or purpose. Examples can be statistical, academic evidence, or they can be real life examples which solidify the point. Exemplification writing allows us to grant the reader a deeper perspective regarding the real world applications of our argument. 
you've ever heard someone say, for example, and then they provide some information which will make their point seem more relevant or more pertinent to you, right? So exemplification is the use of examples. Specifically, we are going to be using exemplification to find scholarly literature that helps us prove an argument. We use the examples given by people in the field that have credibility in order to fortify our argumentative claim. Next, classification writing. Sometimes this is called classification and division. Uh, classification writing involves breaking down a broad category into smaller and more digestible pieces. Classification writing is, classification writing is useful when we are juggling a broad and multifaceted subject which would benefit from dissection. Examples of classification writing uh, is starting out with the American South and breaking it down state by state, explaining the similarities, differences, and nuances between each state that, that comprises the whole region. Okay, so it's basically like taking things and breaking them down into categories. Another example of classification writing is like if you wanted to do a classification essay on bears, right? You have the broad topic of bears. That's a pretty broad topic. There are lots of different kinds of bears. And then maybe in each of the paragraphs, you go into another specific type of bear uh, and break it down that way, right? Cool. We are just blazing through this. So like I said, this is just meant to be an overview. We are going to discuss these much in much greater detail in the coming weeks. Process writing. Process writing explains how to do something directional or how something works. This form of writing can be useful for training coworkers or getting a client to understand new software. You want to be very meticulous and construct the product process chronologically so that it can be repeated by your reader. It's very important that process writing is done chronologically because if you put steps in the wrong order, you're not going to get the desired effect, right? Uh, so think of writing a recipe. If you get things mixed up for your reader, they won't think your cooking is any good. Or they'll make the souffle and it'll collapse in, in the cupboard, right? Whatever it does. Do people actually make souffles? I don't even know that I've ever eaten souffle in my life. To be honest. Perhaps I should amend that. Definition. Uh, writing to define something. Yes, it really is that simple. Though it seems basic, we must take care to shape our definitions wisely. As they establish the framework through which we view a given situation. When practicing definition writing, focus on the essential specific details which are unique to the character of the thing that you are defining. Um, remember that definition is different than description and that definition also includes the function of the thing, not just how the thing looks and feels and sounds and smells, but also what its intended purpose and function is, right? So that's a little bit different. They're, those are closely related, but they're a little different. Moving right along. Hope I'm not blazing through it. You can always watch uh, over again if you feel like you need to slow it down. Feel free to pause. Uh, compare and contrast. So sometimes the best way to understand something is by putting it next to something else. You've heard the, the phrase apples and oranges. Um, apples and oranges are both fruit. That In that way they compare, but they can also be heavily contrasted with different colors. They have different tastes, different textures, different... Um, qualities, right? One of them has a big thick rind around it, the other one you kind of eat the skin. So uh, putting two things next to each other and comparing and contrasting them to sort of better understand both things by virtue to their relationship with one another, by virtue of their relationship with one another, right? So uh, more than simply listing set similarities and differences from one sentence to another, comparison and contrast focuses on the objects in conversation with one another. What sort of relationship do these objects have? Try to note the similarities and differences in an objective and meaningful way. So if you wanted to do an essay on, let's say, frogs and toads, yes, they are different. People don't realize that. People think that frogs and toads are the same thing, and they are both amphibians, and they're very closely related, but they're different. There are some differences. Uh, toads spend most of their life on land. Frogs spend a large portion of their life in water. Uh, they have slightly slight variations in diet, slight variations in reproductive tendency, slight variations in distribution, right? So you could compare and contrast frogs and toads and by doing so, you would give your reader a better understanding of both. Cause and effect. A cause is something that produces an event or condition. An effect is what results from an event or condition. The purpose of the cause and effect essay is to determine how various phenomena relate in terms of origins and results. This form of writing is useful for explaining the potential risks and consequences of certain business decisions. So if you expand into this region, it will cause X amount of strain on our distribution and you will lose this amount of money, right? If you do this thing, it will cause these effects, 
right? So cause and effect is a good strategy. Some people do like cause and effects of different disasters, uh, different things that can happen. It's just a great way to think about like what the effects of the things we do might be. And it's a good way to convince people not to do those things or to do those things, depending on what the effects, if they're beneficial or negative. And then there are persuasion and argumentation, which are very closely related. Uh, they used to kind of be considered the same thing, but I think the new, the new text, um, the new adaptations to the course uh, have them separate. So we'll, we'll just talk about them kind of as the same thing, and then later we'll go into some more detail. The purpose of persuasive or argumentative writing is to convince your audience of your position's merit, to convince them that it is true, right? Uh, you will assert an argumentative claim and fortify this claim with evidence and analysis. Argumentation is probably the most important rhetorical strategy. That's just me talking, uh, especially in a, in a college setting, because you're trying to think for yourself. You're trying to learn how to put forth a position and to defend the position with evidence and then analysis, right? Explaining how the evidence proves the assertion that you've made. Uh, so it is very important. Your third, your second and third essays will, will involve, to some degree, argumentative writing or persuasive writing. So this is the one that we're going to really, really hone in on. Uh, once we get past the first essay in particular. So um, that's the final strategy. Those are the ones that we're going to look at. Some of them we actually won't use on the essay. The first essay, you have a choice of five, five rhetorical strategies. And I believe, let me go back here and make sure that I can. I believe they are. On the first essay, you can choose any one of the following strategies. Narration, uh, classification division, process writing, uh, compare and contrast, or cause and effect. So you have a choice of those five. And if you want to go look at the essay prompt, it's already in there. You can go look at the assignment sheet. You pick your own topic, you pick your own strategy, and you write an essay. So you could do a process essay on how to make ramen noodles. Uh, the funny thing is, is that everyone disagrees on how to make ramen noodles. And every time we do that as a class, sometimes I do that as like an exercise, uh, fights break out. Okay, because people are not not literally, but people are very serious about their ramen, and woe be unto you if you don't do it exactly the way they do, right? So, uh, you know, process on ramen, you could do compare and contrast on frogs and toads. Uh, you could do a narration about the time you got covered in a swarm of bees. Whatever you want to do, okay, um, that's kind of wide open. You've got five strategies and any topic you want. We're going to be learning and practicing the strategies as we go along. And mastering these strategies is the key to getting out of this class. So I hope, uh, I would normally ask if there were any questions, but since you can't respond to me, I'll just move on to the next thing. Hopefully that was clear enough. Uh, so for the next thing, we're going to talk about plagiarism real quick. I know that this wasn't included on the syllabus, but I thought about it beforehand. I'm like, we really got to talk about it. What is plagiarism? The definition of plagiarism is to steal and pass off the idea or the ideas or words of another as one's own, to use another's production without crediting the source, to commit literary theft, or pre to present as new and original an idea or product derived from an existing source. So you are going to be using sources from other people. But what makes it plagiarism is if you use the source from the other person and then you don't tell me that you used it by virtue of quotes and citations, then that means you're basically saying, hey, this is mine, I made this. And then if I find out that you didn't, you get a big old goose egg on the assignment. And if you get a goose egg on an essay that's worth 20%, well, you can do the math. Okay. Uh, so it's an act of fraud. It is very serious. And there's a reason that academic institutions take it very seriously. Because some of this stuff is actually um, you know, the livelihood of the people that produce it. You know, if you plagiarize someone's book, for example, and they're trying to sell the book to pay the bills, well, then you're cutting into their livelihood. You're taking away from their uh, resources. So it's a serious violation. And even though in kind of in the academic setting, you know, it's not as uh, prone to creating victims, it's still very serious and it's treated very seriously by any institution that you go to. So there are, there are different types of plagiarism. There is accidental plagiarism. This kind of scares students because you can't do it by accident. And I, I typically do have students occasionally plagiarized by accident because they don't understand what it is, which is why we're doing this slideshow. There's also intentional plagiarism, which means that you stole this on purpose. You did it for a reason, right? And then there's self-plagiarism. What? Self-plagiarism? Yes, you can plagiarize yourself, and I will explain that in just a moment. So accidental plagiarism happens when people omit quotation marks. They use a quote. They forget to put the quotes around it. They forget to put citations. Or sometimes they'll paraphrase a quote and they'll do it incorrectly. 
um, which is technically academic dishonesty because you're changing what's being said. So these are ways that you can accidentally create problems for yourself. Um, the, the best way to make sure this doesn't happen is if you use a quote from another source, use quotation marks, use citations. Tell me where the source came from. And we'll, of course, talk about what that means. Intentional plagiarism is purposely eliminating a citation from information that comes from another source, using an incorrect citation so that I can't locate the original source. Big one, using another student's work as your own. And this is really like with the plagiarism check in the turn it in, really the only way that you can get away with cheating, and it's very rare that people actually do get away with cheating, but the only way that you can is by getting someone else to do the work for you from scratch, completely originally, without using any sources or anything like that. Um, most of the time that never works out, because what will happen is people will, I've noticed that people will get um, a person to write an essay, and they'll have a certain writing style for the first two essays. But then at the end of the semester, that person's not available anymore. Maybe they have their own classes. Maybe they had a falling out. Um, and the writing style will suddenly change. If I notice that your writing style changes dramatically from one essay to the other, that's a red flag for me. And I will ask you, I will call you over and ask you what happened, and, and I'll ask you details about the previous essay and all this stuff. So it, it's not foolhardy by any means. And usually I can tell if I have samples of your writing, say in the discussions or it's something we do in class, and the samples of the writing don't it match up. If you're if you're writing it like a, a college freshman level in class, but then you give me essays that are like graduate student level, that's a red flag, right? Also, purchasing an essay from an internet source, don't ever do that because all of that stuff is in the Turnitin database and you will get caught. Uh, it doesn't matter if the website is free. Um, if you copy a quote without using quotation marks as plagiarism. Excessive collaboration, this is a big one. A lot of times students will say, well, it only looks like plagiarism because me and so-and-so put our Wonder Twin power together and uh, we came up with this essay together. Well, that's plagiarism because you excessively collaborated and therefore the material is not, it's not original for either of you, right? Um, people try to write stuff very close to the original. They'll go, well, if I, if I change the words, if I change the words around and I, and I switch things up, then he won't be able to detect it. The problem with that is, is that it usually gets detected anyway because it's not just the words themselves, but also the syntax or the order that they're in that the plagiarism check looks for. Um, but also, you know, a lot of times the synonyms aren't that clever and they're, I'll go, wait, what? And I'll look at it, that doesn't make sense. Um, people that try to do that, that try to beat the machine, they always fail. Please, let's just not do this this semester. I'm asking you sincerely, let's not, because I don't, I hate giving people zeros. I hate ruining your academic livelihood. Well, you ruined it yourself, but I, I hate being the uh, vehicle by which that is completed. So let's just not. Uh, so the self-plagiarism thing, to put it simply, you need to treat every assignment that you have to do in college as an independent assignment, right? So like if you take the same class over and you write essay one and then you take the class again because you failed it and you hand in the same essay one, that's plagiarism because you didn't treat the assignment as new. You failed the class the first time, but you tried to use some of your efforts to pass it the second time, but you're you're ending up you're just like not doing the work, right? You're not you're not starting from scratch. You're not starting anew. So it is self plagiarism, and you need to don't recycle work for other classes. Don't recycle essays that you've done before. That type. Of thing. Okay, just put it very simple. It's not plagiarism to paraphrase or summarize information from another source that is correctly documented. You will be using other sources as long as it's quoted, cited, and has a work cited page with the citation information, so I can look it up. You have no problem. You can use secondary sources all day long. No sweat. Uh, use quotation marks um, and include citations with uh, page or paragraph numbers. We'll talk more about that with MLA formatting. Um, what is not plagiarism? Copying information from an internet source and using quotation marks in a citation or using a citation for information that is common knowledge. So you don't, if this, you don't have to cite, like if you say the sun is a ball of gas burning millions of miles away, you don't have to cite that because everybody knows that. At least I hope they do. Um, some people may think the sun is some kind of god or something. I don't know. But, but most people know that it's a big ball of gas burning millions of miles away. And so it's common knowledge. And there's no reason for you to like look that up and cite it. Um, so common knowledge is, is OK. Don't need to cite. So we have a zero tolerance uh, policy for plagiarism. 
Um, you're going to get, if you plagiarize any assignment, doesn't matter if it's a discussion board, a quiz, a essay, whatever, if you plagiarize anything, you're going to get a zero. Okay, and there's no arguing with me over that. You're going to get a zero. And then if I think it's, if, if I think it's a really bad case of like you were trying to deceive me, like you did this intention, if I can prove intent, usually I will uh, turn that over to the administration. Okay, which is not something I like doing, but I, we can't have people that are intentionally deceiving people um, and trying to, because it undermines our institution and it undermines the value of the degree that you're getting. Right, because if people can just cheat through and get a degree, then what does a degree mean? Because you can just cheat, right? So uh, if I catch you, you're going to flunk, and it's not going to be fun. So let's not do it. And just so you know, I'm not a hypocrite. Here's where I got a lot of this information. And then I always like to include a picture of my rooster, Oscar Goldman. Look at him. Look at how pretty he is. Isn't he handsome? All right. So that takes care of that. Now. We do have to go over MLA real quick. So to do that, I'm going to share my application or screen with you. OK. So you should be able to see now what I am seeing, I believe. Whoa. Ah. Ah. Um, OK. So here is the course shell, okay? This is our, our course here. Uh, and this is the lessons tab, you click on this. This has all the stuff, right? I, I sort of condensed everything down into just a couple of folders to make it easy to navigate. Um, so if you're looking for the MLA stuff, you see this folder right here is called writing resources. Click on writing resources, it opens it up. There's all kinds of stuff. Here's some stuff on plagiarism. Here's some stuff on understanding writing from. If you look right here, there's a, a little folder that says MLA formatting. Now, what is MLA formatting? Well, your essay has to be formatted a very specific way. It has to have certain, certain uh, font size, certain um, spacing, all these different little nitpicky things. And it's really annoying, and it's probably my least favorite part of the job is dealing with MLA. But it has to be an MLA format. MLA format counts for 20% of the essay grade. So if you end in an essay with bad MLA format, the highest you can get is an 80. That's not good. So check this out. We got a couple of different things here. Here's a step-by-step -step guide. Um, and so if you want to know how to do the double spacing, how to format the margins and font, how to insert the page number, all of this stuff is um, there to help you format. Use the word processor. I know the word processor is tough for some people to use, so I won't go into a huge spiel on that. Uh, this will just help you with those little problems that tend to arise. But if you go back here, I'm going to open the quick guide. And this is just going to tell you all the basics. We'll just go through this real quick, burn through it, and then if we got to talk about this more later, we will. I'm going to let you sort of figure it out. So here are the basic MLA formatting. The margins, which are like the edges of the page, have to be one inch in length. Okay? <clears throat> so make sure you have the right margins. Uh, don't try to do the big margins to make it look like your essay is longer than it really is. You, there's no trick that you can do that I haven't seen before, so let's just not. It, it just makes you look silly. Uh, okay, so it has to be Times New Roman 12-point font. It has to be double-spaced, left-aligned, so not centered. A lot of people will center stuff because it looks nice, but we want it left-aligned. And then we need what's called a header, and that's the last name and page number at the top of every, the top right-hand corner of every page. All right, that's a header. But we also need a heading. Now the heading only goes at the on the first page in the top left. And it contains the student's first and last name, the professor's name. Make sure you spell my name with a Y, B R Y N. Uh, the course and section number, so that's English 1101. And then the date. And this is European style date. So it goes day, month, year. We usually do month, day, year, but uh, they do it different. So do it like that. Um, then you need in-text citations. So if you quote anything from a source. Uh, you need to include in-text citations, also known as parenthetical citations. Okay? So this method involves placing relevant source information, usually the author's last name and page number, from the source in parentheses after a quote or a paraphrase. Any source information that you provide for in-text citation must correspond to the source information on the work cited page. More specifically, whatever signal word or phrase you provide to your readers in the text must be the first thing that appears in the left-hand margin of the corresponding entry in the work cited list which is usually the author's name. Sometimes there are instances where you cannot find 
an author's name. Uh, and you'll have to look that up specifically yourself. Um, the author's name may appear either in the sentence itself or in the parentheses following the quotation or paraphrase, but the page number should always appear in the parentheses, not in the text of your sentence. For example, Wordsworth stated that romantic poetry was marked by a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And then we have parentheses, 263, closed parentheses, period. So what that means is we know that Wordsworth is the guy that wrote this. So when we go to a works cited page, we're going to look for Wordsworth, and we know that it comes from page 263. Now, we know that because we mentioned Wordsworth in the sentence. But if you don't mention Wordsworth in the sentence, you have to include his last name in the parentheses. So if you look at the next one, romantic poetry is characterized by the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Uh, parentheses, Wordsworth 263. Um, or Wordsworth extensively explode the role of emotion creative processes 263. So these are all correct. Okay. Uh, and that citation, which goes at the end of the quote, tells me where it came from. And that's how you avoid plagiarism. <laughs> you give, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> you give credit to the proper source. Okay. Um, then there's something called a block quotation. So if you have a quote that runs over four lines, uh, it has to be set off from the text by beginning a new line, indenting one inch from the left, one inch from the left margin, and typing in double space without adding quotation marks. Um, that's a very rare thing. Just know. If you go, if you have a quote and it goes over four full lines of text, that's a big old quote. But if you have one that's that big, it needs to be formatted with a block quotation format. So look that up. Make sure you do it correctly. Here's the works cited page. Uh, so the works cited page is a separate page of the essay. It usually goes at the end. It has some pages works cited, and then it has the publication information. This is usually how the information is listed. Now this will change around depending on the source. If you're using like a movie or something weird like that, it will change a little bit. Usually it's the author, the title of the source, the title of the container, so that's like the journal that it's in or the, you know, whatever. Uh, other contributors, the version, the number, the publisher, the publication date, and the location. So it, this goes through telling you exactly what all that stuff is, right? The version, the, explaining it very clearly. Here's an example of the work cited, right? Uh, and how to do different different formats. So here's a book, here's a film, here's a journal, here's a work in an anthology. Each type of source that you cite will have a slight variation in terms of the uh, citation information which is required on the works cited page. So if you have a source that's like an article from a journal or a book or a film, make sure you look up each of those independently so that you will include the correct citation information. Um, it's just a, a good rule of thumb. I know it's a pain to have to look all this stuff up independently all the time, um, but you know, once you do it once, you really don't have to do it again. And so, and we won't be doing a whole lot of extra research, but we will be doing some. So this is important to understand. All right. So going back to this and looking at, at this one more thing here, um, here's an example of the works cited page, or examples of different works cited, uh, just to show you, right? So you have access to this information. Different types of sources, religious text, online text, film, video, television, YouTube. You can cite anything, folks. It's all there. And it all has kind of a different layout. So this is just examples of how to do it. Okay. Um, and I will show you more about MLA. I'm not going to talk about that too much because the essay is still, still a ways off. We've got a couple of couple of weeks before we got to worry about the essay. So this is a general work, uh, the general MLA format. And remember, that is 20% in each essay, um, the essay rubric. Formatting is 20%. So please make sure that you look through this. Um, the last thing and the thing I'll end on is a great, um, a great resource is this Purdue Online Writing Lab. Uh, and what this will do is help you. Here's the MLA guide here. It's a free style guide, so it'll tell you everything you need to know. If you've got to look up something, um, you know, it's got all sorts of different things. Ordinary formatting style guide. Here's stuff on quotations, footnotes. Basically, we don't do footnotes, but basic format. Um, works cited for books, works cited for periodicals, other common sources. Anything you could ever imagine is on this website. Great free resource for you to be able to use. So please keep that on your radar. If you have anything, if you're not sure, try to look it up yourself. You can also email me a question, but it, it's better to teach yourself this kind of stuff because then I think you remember it better. Um, so ooh, here we are back to the to this again. Uh, I think that's all I've got for you today. So we're going to end it there. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please 
don't hesitate to email me, brian.murphy, B-R-Y-A-N dot Murphy at westatech.edu. Please remember that email is the best way to get in contact with me. Have an excellent week, and let me know if you need any help.